Hi, everybody. Um, we brought half the museum with us today, so <laughs> we're, but we're so excited. Thank you uh, to the Center of the Center for the Art of East Asia for hosting. Um, and thanks for everyone for coming and being able to be here and, and hear our talk and talk about the work that we're doing at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, we wanted to talk today about the work that different groups in our museum are, is doing to expose collection data, cultural, scientific objects to our very broad audience at the museum, um, both on site at the museum and then also online. Um, You. Right. So basically, we are representing two media teams. So I'm from a media team called Science Visualization Group. So it's a media production group in education department. I don't know if I can. Yeah, cool. That's me. <laughs> so our group produces videos, data visualizations, and new media uh, experiences that leverage some new, you know, technologies, augmented reality, virtual reality to really engage museum visitors with stories and messages that museum, our museum wants to communicate with general public. And essentially, most of the time, it's about like some new scientific findings in the field, exciting news and important concept. And we work with a lot of different scientists and then covering different topics. And because we make the six exhibits for uh, like general public, we make sure it's we serve group experience. And then like sometimes we experiment with augmented reality, mixed reality, and all that stuff that was a little fast. <laughs> and then they experiment uh, with all that in the whole so that like people can have all the access to this technology as well as some exciting experience. That's what our group does. And most recently, so just day before yesterday, we just launched Invisible Words, which is immersive, interactive, 360 projection mapping, yeah, theater experience, 12 minute long, in this big room that could accommodate up to 180 people. So yeah, please stay tuned. And then if you're in New York, please visit us. And I'm gonna hand it off to the next team. Um. Yeah, so Hyun and I are in the exhibition department at the museum, and we have a group, a small group, called the Media and Interactives group, and we make a lot of different media for our temporary and our permanent galleries. Um, some of the things we do are large-scale projections, like these are from a few of our recent uh, temporary exhibits. This was from Nature of Color. Um, we really wanted to allow visitors to play with color, and they said we couldn't use paint, so we used projection instead, and you could, with your body, uh, be moving around and mixing um, colors and paint. Um, this one on the right is from our T-Rex exhibit. Uh, it was a reactive T-Rex, so um, there were sensors in the ceiling that could tell where people were, and the T-Rex would come and approach you and sometimes snap at, uh, at the kids. It was very popular, very fun to see everyone engaging with these, with these pieces. Um, we also do uh, hands-on installations, and Haley's going to talk about that. Uh, yeah. So. We, um, even though like we make a lot of digital media, we try to use a lot of like tactile experience to giving the um, the visitors. Um, so this one I uh, would like to introduce is about it's called Indigo Table. So we in the color exhibition we try to explain how to like make an indigo dye in the traditional way, but also as an interaction designer I uh, research and learn there are a lot of like beautiful and very like meditating a way to make it. So like I tried to we tried to design the interaction with a lot of like hand gesture and like tactile object to like actually make that uh, experience. And after pandemic, <laughs> we actually plan to create a touch-free uh, installation for shark exhibition. This is actually ongoing exhibitions. So when you go to New York, you can actually see this shark exhibition in uh, American Museum of Natural History. Um, especially the on the right that um, called Hunt Like a Hammerhead Interactive, um, produced by CDM producer uh, Ariel. He um, made a really like actually fun uh, hardware. Um, so this is a, like uh, the user actually can drive the sh sh ha hammerhead by hand, but there is actually like ha there is like tactile feedback on the their farm. So they actually using the ultrasonic speaker to actually can feel the haptic feedback on their thumb, but without touch. 
And in all the media, so we do a lot of varied media, but in everything we do, we really, we try to think a lot about what is, um, what's the reason for being here at the museum? What can you do here at our museum that you can't get anywhere else, that you can't get on an iPad or on your phone at home or, um, or somewhere else? So we, try to, we, we really try to use our space, our scale, um, and, and physical and digital interaction to, to really bring that out for our visitors. Um, we had a, a really great opportunity that wrapped up at the end of, in May of last year, renovating the Northwest Coast Hall. Um, this was a really important renovation for the museum. It was one of the first um, cultural hall renovations in a very long time. If you've been to the Natural History Museum before, uh, well, any time before <laughs> May of last year, this is probably what you saw in the Northwest Coast, Coast Hall. Um, it's a beautiful hall. It smells great. You can smell the cedar of the, of the monumental carvings, and um, it's really uh, a wonderful space. But it was um, dark. Uh, the, the labels needed reworking. The text was um, in sore need of replacement. And, um, and the cases, you can see, they're kind of dark and, uh, and not really highlighting the, um, the beautiful work. So this is what the gallery looks like now. Um, this was really transformative. Um, now this, this hall is a place that really showcases the beauty of these treasured belongings that we are privileged to be holding and, um, and displaying to the public. It was also an opportunity for the museum. We, we really had to change the way that we worked on exhibits, the way that we presented, the way that we, that we thought about this and the process that we used to, to create exhibits. Um, we had uh, a co-curator, Hayups, he is the one in red there, um, as uh, a co-curator for the project and we also had uh, cultural advisors, consulting curators from each of the eight nation groups that were represented in the hall. And we were able to bring more diverse voices into the process of, of creating this exhibit. And it really was a, a wonderful experience. Um, we, we had to do a lot more listening than, than speaking um, when we were creating this. And, and, um, and bringing these voices of descendant communities who, you know, the objects and the things here are, are so important to, um, to this conversation, forefronting the, the issues, challenges, and triumphs that were important to each group. Um, I wanted to put this in here because the overarching theme that we, we kept hearing from our, from our consulting curators was this, we are still here. Um, these, aren't, these aren't communities that are gone, these are living communities, and, and we, we put it right up on the wall uh, when you enter the gallery. Uh, it's it's a, a great reminder, and, and it, was, it was a wonderful experience to work with them. Um, the hall is, I've got a little video, the hall is organized by nation groups. So there's these eight kind of, we call them alcoves. They're not so much alcoves anymore um, that have all the, the belongings um, for each one. We also have a few intro sections and uh, an introductory video, which we worked with the native filmmaker on. Um, and within each of these alcoves, we have uh, produced an interactive kiosk. So there's Haley using it right there. Um, they all have a, a welcome to nation by a community member for that, um, for that nation, and often in their own language and then also in English. Uh, we, we have stories in this kiosk um, about important issues, um, ceremony, community, language, and, uh, and a section aimed especially for, for kids. Um, here is a, a, a digital, a 3D object, um, a, a scan we had of a mask, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this process in just a minute. Um, here's this language section that I talked about so you could hear people speaking their language. Um, that was something that was really important to our, our curators, uh, was to be able to hear the native language in the hall. And this is that for kids section. We uh, made puzzles that kids could, um, could put together. Um, and uh, so our curators wanted to showcase the beauty and detail of some of these uh, objects, some of these belongings in the hall, 
and let visitors view them from new angles or get a closer view. Um, they were also very interested in making these assets available to community members who aren't able to come to the museum or who aren't coming to the museum and um, so they can study and use them in, and appreciate them. We had one member of our consulting curator group who is a, a carver and he said he learned a lot about his own culture from studying the objects in the museum and from being able to have access to them and be able to look at them up close and, and see how they were put together, um, the masks and the poles, and it was, uh, it was really important to him. So this is something that we, that we worked on and tried to, to um, bring into the halls. slide deck is crashing. <laughs> what else? Oh, oh. Too many videos. Sorry, just a second. Okay. Yeah, this, Which one? this one. Okay. <laughs> So um, in the, as you see the like 3D viewer, we uh, have a like kind of like wanting to make a 3D um, model from our collection for Northwest Coast. Um, so to create the, this model, um, we ask each um, cultural advisor to choose a uh, object based on the sensitivity and the objects that are interesting to see show like different angles um, that might be like visitors that may be not able to see on the back. Um, so we chose like 29 or 30 of us actually from the uh, eight nations. So this is a, actually the behind the scene of the North West Coast. It's nothing like very fancy. We actually really try and like see how it actually um, like goes. So uh, there's a Carlo who is our producer and there's Alex from the senior technician in, in anthropology. So. Um, we are not a conservationist, so like we really working with a collection manager and technician in the anthropology department, and we very like aware of like sensitivity of the fragile object. So it's not a like very ideal solution for like photogrammetry. Like we cannot have a lot of like photogrammetry that like we can have make um, like really nice lizard, but we try to take a video first in this um, environment. Um, but successfully, <laughs> it's a kind of we have a really good lizard. So this is a like a healthy uh, hill, hiller pot rattle, and they had a really like nice detail on the side and the back. Uh, so we can have a really good uh, model from it. And another example is trinket, like a fighting hamlet. That also like we have a really good lizard to it. But of course, it's not always successful. I don't know like how you have like experience with photogrammetry. Uh, sometimes like it's really difficult to get a good result. So for example, this one, we cannot actually control the lighting in the anthropology um, place. So like there are a lot of like lighting reflection make a really bad texture. Sometimes like objects are very small and a lot of detail, there's not many like a point that uh, software can recognize it. So we couldn't have like everything like good result. But like after all like Trier and errors, we have a really nice um, 20 successful models to use our media um, like kiosk. And basically there are a lot of overlaps between their work and our work, so we use similar type of technologies to digitize the items, and sometimes we just deal with this inherent digital item or dirty scan, CT scan, or reconstructed item, and then we use all of them, and then the destination could be varied like this from VR to touch table. And I'm just gonna go real quick uh, to show how we integrated this into our like workflow slash production process. So one of our early project, 2017, is like, just experimenting with AR, basically putting, superimposing this digital asset on the top of the physical uh, exhibit so that you can have kind of a see-through experience. 
And for this, the source is from the scientists, so they generate this digital CT scan that basically inherently digital assets as a part of their research. And they provide us, and it's clean, production ready. And what we did is we made our very rough sketch scan and then try to combine them together and so make that CT scan shark uh, pose like the 3D scan of the display and the matching poses so that we had this kind of view and also animate it so you can see how it bites and how it moves the tail to swim. And the next example is uh, from 2019. It's a multiplayer wireless interactive VR experience as a part of the T-Rex exhibit. It's called T-Rex Skeleton Crew. So what you do in this experience is basically you team up with two other fellow builders slash <laughs> visitors and then you build a T-Rex skeleton together in virtual museum hall and then it transports you into a paleontology environment if you do it successfully and then so you're taken to different time and space basically Hal Craig Montana again 66 million years ago where you see the T-Rex comes to life and like I said before, it's designed to be a social experience where you can collaborate with others and cheering on each other, sharing the sense of achievement. And to the key to the for the success of this project was making really immersive, engaging, like really well, beautiful, stylized um, virtual museum hall with T-Rex that's scientifically accurate. It's because this is the main thing you're gonna interact with for like 10 minutes in VR. So to create that, we took this um, scale T-Rex model from paleontologist office, and basically we applied the same process, which is scanning, actually a uh, program entry. So we got really good model of that. And so this is now just usual part of our process. So we kind of apply this process, digitizing a physical model and then make it as a, our base model, our base environment, so that we can speed up our execution. And just moving on to Astro Content, another venue, uh, avenue of our work is to create tools to visualize scientific data and introduce new engaging ways to explore and learn about it. And so one tool we built is Open Space. So it's an open source interactive software designed to visualize the entire known universe. So it's a NASA funded project and we used it not only in the classroom but for presentation and sometimes to power the planetarium show. So, and right, and we are, we keep adding uh, the visualizations and simulations from NASA. So what you're seeing here is the magnetosphere of the Earth. So we, what we try to do is like putting all entire universe into, and the human effort to exploration <laughs> into one software. And then uh, last year was the 50th anniversary for Apollo mission. So it happened 1972, December. And that's the last final mission of NASA's Apollo program, so it was very meaningful. And we use, uh, we found this image gallery, it's publicly available, it's on Flickr. So basically, uh, NASA astronauts in that mission took selfies and found photos and <laughs> share it and make it available public. And we found this group of photos of a rock on the moon. And then that made us think, oh, why don't you use it for uh, something that we are good at, which is digitizing and uh, putting in this programmetry software, basically 24 photos only. Then we are able to successfully reconstruct a rock on the moon. So this is the view from the open space, which is highlighting that landing site. And you can fly very close to the rock. I feel like you're an astronaut who visited there in 1972. And you can have really detailed look of it. And it's real-time engine that you can have on your computer so you can make your own exploration. And what struck me the most is we were able to recreate some iconic historic moment in this digital software. So basically this is like one of the most iconic photos from that Apollo mission. You're looking back towards home <laughs> and you see this like earth rise, not sunrise or moonrise, but earth rise. And it's so familiar for us to stand on earth and look up at the moon or sun, but doing the opposite is difficult to imagine. But with this visualization tool, 
we can kind of recreate it and not only uh, showing the rock and the landscape of the moon. So this is basically taking you back, taking Earth back to that time. So this is where the Earth was located back then. And that's for the space exploration. And I'm going to take us back to our museum collections. Um, so we have a massive collection. So we have over 34 million specimens and cultural artifacts in our collection. But less than 10% of them are exhibited. But with the new building, probably this number has been changed. So a lot of our visitors don't have a chance to like, explore the rest, last like, massive part of the collection. So our group has been thinking about, oh, how can we uh, give them better access and get them to know that exists? And uh, our actual digital library, research library, did a great job in digitizing a lot of that. So we have a digital special collections, basically consists of a lot of, as you can see, paintings, photos, field notes, uh, scientific illustration, and et cetera. Uh, so we are like, oh, that's digital asset we can leverage. So in 2019, as a part of uh, the museum's 150th anniversary celebration, we created some prototypes and visualizations to explore and then enhance our understanding of the collection and just try to like, see the enormity of this, this whole collection. This is large. And then we had to process visually to understand how large collection we have, how diverse items we have. And another example here is an inter interface for exploring our historical data and uh, by seeing the desert items, like floor plans, historic images, and annual reports in one interface. And the last one here is the mosaic uh, that represents 13,000 digitized images in our photographic collections, and the photos are analyzed by a machine learning algorithm that extracts hidden features and organizes and highlights them in many different interesting ways, and also applying some different filters. So we inspire ourselves with our work, and then we started envisioning what if we have some sort of tool specialized in visualizing our collection as a whole and transforms that into an engaging immersive experience that provides a comprehensive context of the collected items and assets? Because it's going to help not only us, but for the you know, general public. So we built a tool called Collection Scope. It's a web-based engine that visualizes museum collections across time and space in a 3D immersive environment. So you can explore them through lens of time, lens of space, that I'm going to show you here. So what you're looking at is the quarter million items in our anthropology collection. So you can see what's in there. And you can try out different layout. This is the timeline view. So you can move back and forth in time or like explore this way, like where things are collected and then which region we have the massive collection, the biggest collection, what's the volume of the collection from specific um, country, et cetera. So there's a lot <laughs> to learn. And then once we put this here, it's like, oh my God, there's so much story <laughs> we can talk about. It's not only about individual items in the collection, but also about like the, the whole collection, like just trying different ways of visualizing and viewing the collection that like just sparked the creativity on, in our team at least to really understand and viewing this um, whole collection differently. For example, we found interesting patterns um, in, you can see some gap between uh, certain years, which represents, oh, we didn't really collect items that year, what happened? And historically, there's like World War II or something, so museum couldn't take expedition or anything to collect items, so that's why there's a gap. So there's some interesting patterns we were able to uh, find. But the real power of this tool is you can plug, plug and play with your collection. So basically, directly it works with any collections if you format it right. So for example, we took open access uh, collection from the MAT, Metropolitan Museum of Art. So this is their version. We just provided this. <laughs> and you can see visually, it's very warm. It's already very different. It has different pattern. It has different density. So you can kind of compare if you put different data set, and you can create your own version of this. Oh. And just the last one about this collection scope. 
So you can basically, oh, I don't want to crush this. <laughs> I was going to jump. Oh, OK, it's not going to. Never mind. The thing is, um, we have experimental support for different platforms, like virtual reality. So what you can do in this um, or the world of collection, you can immerse yourself in this three-dimensional um, 3D visualization of the collection. So yeah, you can experience it in many different ways and then really have a sense of scale, like just surrounded by this massive collection that feels very different. I'm gonna skip that. And our vision for the future, so probably the next version is to bring it back to the hole like we did with Shark. So overlaying on the top of the physical display and blending the physical and virtual museum experience, that's what we wanna do. Eventually, uh, make it as a social activity so you're not there in black immersive space by yourself, but you can have somebody else or curator with you and explore the way you do in physical space. So it could be fun group activity, exchanging ideas, and uh, sharing your findings. So from this, like, which is very inaccessible to public, and we thought, we imagined for the future, the collection could look like this, which is accessible, available anytime, anywhere, uh, like your living room and really have it as an engaging, interesting, inspiring experience. Thank you. Um, we've learned a lot about these, uh, about our collection and, and exposing this to our, our visitors. We've learned um, a lot on the production side as we've, we've had these projects and, and prototypes and experiences, and we're uh, continuing to do this kind of work at the museum. Um, just two days ago, we opened the Gilder Center, uh, the Richard Gilder Center for Science, Education, and Innovation to the public. Um, and part of that new building is a, uh, a collection core. This is a new exhibit that spans three floors and showcases over 3,000 objects from over 35 different groups, representing all the various collections of the museum. Um, as part of this, there are seven of these 100-inch touchscreens that uh, visitors can explore the individual objects, um, their tag and information IDs, um, stories involving these collections, and we especially wanted to highlight the people who create, use, and study these collections um, and why they're important, why we have them, why we collect at all as a, as a museum. And similar to the Northwest Coast, we, we wanted to use this opportunity to talk about pressing contemporary issues around collecting practices, climate change, and our impact on the planet. Um, going forward, we expect this work to increase. Um, we expect that we'll be using data in more interesting ways as we are um, trying out these prototypes and trying things in the galleries and seeing good response and feedback from our visitors. Um, we're hoping to renovate more cultural halls in the near future and working with descendant communities on those halls and to find ways to bring these collections and uh, cultural objects to our visitors to tell important stories and to give context to all the the work that we house in our museum. And for update from education department, uh, we are planning to actively invite students and younger generation people as a part of our digitization process so they can contribute to, you know, build our, uh, our digital collections so they can see their scanned items uh, in our potentially the digital collection that I showed you on the website so that they have a sense of like ownership and then they can really, yeah, we can add more to the catalog and then utilize in our, you know, making fun experiences. So that's it for the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>